You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. Scrolling through social media can often feel like wading through a waist-deep river of sh- And I say that as someone who has never had to face the level of harassment that journalists, particularly female journalists, and even more so female journalists of color, deal with on an almost daily basis. So the question becomes, how do we protect ourselves from this harassment and abuse? Is this sort of vitriol just an unavoidable consequence of living a connected life? Or is there a way that we can wrest control back from the opaque algorithms that curate our feeds and give ourselves autonomy over our experience online? Our guest today, after becoming the victim of online harassment several times herself, decided to create a tool that empowers users to do just that. So how does it work? How do they ensure that it silences harassment compared to legitimate dissent? And could this be the first step towards creating a safer, more equitable internet? My name is Joe Fish, and I'm filling in for Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Tracy Chow is a software engineer and an advocate for greater diversity in the tech industry. She's also the founder and CEO of Block Party. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem at all. So just to start, I want to sort of zoom out and look at the issue we're discussing today from sort of a macro lens. So... When it comes to online harassment, and I know that that's uh, you know, a very broad term, and I think we'll sort of hone in and, and define it more precisely in just a moment. But when it comes to online harassment, do we have any idea about the sort of scale of the problem? And how would, how would you even begin to go about quantifying something like that? Yeah, so no one is doing this research on a global scale through all the platforms to fully understand it. But There are some studies in the U.S. we can look at. Um, Pew Research has been releasing a few reports on online harassment. Um, Their most recent one was in January 2021 that said 40% of adults in the U.S. have experienced online harassment. Um, The prior report from 2017, there's this trend line that's going upwards and the severity is also increasing, which is very unfortunate. Um, Mm. There are some numbers that show that it's higher for women and people of color, minorities. but it is very difficult to quantify this, partly as you identified, because what is online harassment or what is harassment is difficult to define. Um, and it's just really hard to look at it on a global scale across all platforms. Right, understood. But, but when you think about online harassment, what are, what are some of the things that sort of immediately come to mind for you? Yeah, there's a whole range. Um, so a couple different frameworks you can use to look at it. One is um, there's the stuff that's very high prevalence, but lower severity. So think about drive-by trolling random people coming to comment on your posts. Um, Sometimes it'll be flavors of sexism or racism, that kind of thing. And then you have much more intense targeted harassment, whether it's one person who is very keen on bothering you, uh, or sometimes it's coordinated attacks. And so you'll sometimes see groups coordinating on forums, sometimes places like Reddit or 4chan, where they're coming together and then coordinating an attack on somebody. Right, right. And that could be, uh, I mean, obviously horrifying for the individual afflicted. And and I'm just wondering, how how did this issue sort of first enter your radar? You know, when when did it go from being something that was sort of a passion or something you were passionate about to something you eventually decided to dedicate your entire professional life to? It started for me just generally being online. And so the earliest experience that I had was sort of online hate or even back in high school. So more than 15 years ago or when that, um, but most acutely in sort of like a personal, uh, professional capacity was um, when I first joined Quora as a software engineer, the question and answer platform, as the second engineer hired onto the team, the first thing I built was the block button because somebody was already harassing me on the site, even though we only had a few thousand users at that time. This was in 2010. 
but it did escalate tremendously as over the years, I've done quite a bit of diversity and inclusion activism and built more of an online presence, particularly on Twitter. And so all those examples I was describing earlier from the sort of like low grade trolling, sexist, misogynistic content to their targeted harassment and coordinated attacks, I've experienced all of those in the course of doing this activism work around diversity. And there were a couple of instances in 2018, not too long before I started Block Party, where I was dealing with these like attacks and trying to report them to the platforms, Twitter and Instagram, Mm -hmm. and just getting the reports turned back with, this is not harassment, we're not going to do anything. And so just using the normal channels that people try to report, I wasn't able to get any kind of action. And because I've been in Silicon Valley for a long time and have a lot of friends who work at the platforms, when I took screenshots and shared them, I have friends and followers who worked at the platforms, escalated internally and got those accounts taken down. And that actually made me more upset that I could get this privileged access. Like I Mm -hmm. could escalate through friends at these companies who could say like, oh, we've dedicated somebody on trust and safety to make sure your case is handled where the average user can't right. get that. And it felt so unfair to have this access. Um, I would much rather be able to go through normal channels and know that the system is working. And so in building Block Party, it felt like trying to bring that special access I had uh, to solve these problems more generally so that everyone can feel safe. You know, what was sort of interesting to me in reading uh, your most recent, or one of your most recent blog posts was y- you mentioned the ability to tag someone in a post or photo online. And to me, it's like sort of amid this sea of toxicity that you encounter on these social platforms, that function, this tagging function, always kind of seemed relatively innocuous in my eyes. Um, But you make a pretty compelling argument why I might be wrong about that. Can you sort of walk me through that? So I think a lot of these tech platforms are built in this way originally, where it seems like these features are very innocuous and they're good things. You can get alerted when a photo of you is posted or somebody is mentioning you, but all of these also become potential abuse and attack vectors. So when somebody is tagged, um, they get a notification no matter what the photo or the comment is. And so the person who's posting that has a way to force their presence and commentary on that person. If you imagine with photos, It could be an abusive photo. It doesn't actually have to be a a photo of that person that they're getting tagged in. Um, I've experienced this where somebody photoshopped photos of me and then tagged me in them. So I was getting notifications to go look at them. And then even apart from like the specific content, the volume of it can be really terrible. If you imagine getting bombarded with hundreds or thousands or more negative comments, Mm -hmm. sometimes they're not even that negative. Like it could just be like these things that happen sometimes when somebody becomes the main character on Twitter and everybody has an opinion and right. it might just be mildly judgmental or somebody commenting on the situation. Um, but when you get this huge wave of comments, people unintentionally piling on, it can feel very terrible and overwhelming. Can you think of any other design features of these social media platforms that on their face kind of seem relatively benign, but then can be sort of utilized by nefarious actors? Like, are there any other other than tagging? Anything can be abused, unfortunately. Um, But a few that come to mind, um, this is not maybe less direct way, but a lot of these platforms have prompts for you to share or post and they want this engagement. That's the metrics that they're aiming for. But when you prompt people to post kind of thoughtlessly, because you've put a big... um, box in front of them and then have all these like cues for them to post something. It encourages thoughtless comments, people like shooting off replies without really thinking them through. And that's not always great for online discourse. Mm -hmm. Replies to stories on a lot of platforms go directly into DMs. Um, So on Instagram, if I post a story and people want to like reply to it or heart it, it'll go into my DM requests which is not awesome. Like sometimes like I don't want to have a whole bunch of DMs from people who are just like commenting on something. Even things like safety features can have these kinds of trade-offs. Mm-hmm. So Twitter recently introduced the ability to turn off replies to tweets, which is a good anti-harassment protection. But this space in replies is also where people do fact-checking or responses to things, right? So right. Um, when that space is gone, then the sort of like misinformation or harassment that could proliferate from the original post 
is unchecked. Um, things like the reporting function um, originally introduced, you could report a bad actor. Have, that has been weaponized in many cases where people will then coordinate trying to take down an account by reporting it a whole bunch. Mm-hmm. So the lesson is essentially anything you build can probably be abused. Another example on the harassment side is um, like Facebook pages where you might want to disallow certain words from being posted because people are using you know, similar insults or insulting words. But then that can be used for censorship um, if you don't want people to bring up certain issues, particularly political ones. So right. it's just a, it's always a balance um, of these different values and things that you want to support. I mean, these things that you're describing that can be sort of weaponized against people, they seem like such sort of almost like fundamental building blocks of like, it almost seems like the ability to harass people is almost written into the DNA of some of these social platforms, which to me makes it seem like a a really daunting task to try and actually, you know, instigate change and build a better, safer internet for people. But that's kind of exactly what you're trying to do with Block Party and with your advocacy. And, and I'm just wondering, what, what to you does that better internet look like? How do we get there or at least begin the journey to getting there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is from the individual perspective. And from that perspective, it's as a person who is going online, you should be in control of your experience. You should have the ability to set your own boundaries around who you want to interact with and what types of content you want to see. And right now, you know, we don't have as much of that. So that's like one big vector that we're working towards. From the ecosystem perspective, um, this better internet where we, we want to build towards has less harassment, less toxicity, less noise. It kind of achieves that promise that we were sold originally about the internet where when you democratize access, democratize content, democratize information, all that stuff. It's supposed to be really good. And so it really is about like achieving that ecosystem where the fact that like we are unconstrained by geography and physics anymore, like it should be a good thing that you can connect with people around the world and be inspired Mm -hmm. and get all the information. They have that democratization. So yeah, it's not easy to get there. But I think even starting from the individual perspective of like being able to set stronger controls so you can continue to participate will have an effect on the ecosystem as well. In terms of that greater autonomy, I know you've spoken a lot about, I I, I guess it would be considered a class of software called middleware, Mm -hmm. which sort of acts as a, I guess, an intermediary between you and the platform and allows you greater access. Can you just explain to me what middleware is and, and how some of it works? It's this idea um, of a layer of tooling that sits in between the users and platforms so they can have more control over their experiences, what content they're seeing, what interactions they have. Block Party is an example of this type of middleware where if you imagine the default behavior of platforms is that you get notifications every time you are tagged in something, Block Party changes that so you don't get notified every time you're tagged. You can filter those mentions and notifications based on the criteria that you've set um, and how, how you want to interact there. Mm-hmm. Other ways that this might look um, in terms of home feed and timeline curation could be, let's say you only want to look at news sources that are more in, in the middle politically and like a bit more um, vetted. You could say, like, I only want to look at these certain types of news sources. Uh, if there's like scientific um, papers coming in, I want the one those ones to be peer reviewed. Mm-hmm. You could imagine even for like kids, if in the future Disney were to implement some kind of like um, home feed algorithm, like you know, they have a different set of choices around what types of content to promote that are more kid friendly. Um, it would be possible to then say, like, I want Disney's choice of home feed for me. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge base of possibility here when it's no longer the platforms deciding what your experience is going to be. And oftentimes with platforms, they are going to pick the sort of average best, the thing that kind of makes sense over the entire population versus what you actually want as an individual. Mm -hmm. And how how have platforms reacted to this? Are they supportive of these sort of third-party 
uh, software solutions or are they resistant? Yes. Yeah, so uh, with Block Party, we're working very closely with Twitter and they've been leaning very hard in this direction of like decentralization and giving people much more choice. So they're very supportive. And this is their vision for the future, which is awesome. They want to encourage like a thriving ecosystem of other developers to build out these different experiences for users. You see some platforms like Discord and Twitch also that are opening up um, these APIs or application programming interfaces so that more people can also be building solutions. Um, and I think we are starting to move in this direction, which is great. There are some companies I think are a bit further behind in thinking about this and still a bit more resistant to giving up that control. Mm-hmm. But when I speak to people at these platforms, I think internally they're starting to come around and realize that it may actually be better to give up some of this control and allow other developers to be building solutions. Right. Well, I mean, you know, we I've read so much about these sort of like content moderation farms at places like Facebook or I guess Meta now. And I suppose, you know, for them, it represents an opportunity because they wouldn't have to pay these thousands of people to, to manually go through and flag problematic content, but rather, you know, offload some of that responsibility onto services like yours and, and the user themselves to, to sort of curate their own feed. Is that fair? Yeah, that's right. With platforms, when they want to assert that total control, then the burden is also very high for them to maintain this standard across the entire platform and make sure it's enforced. And that's where these content moderation farms are coming in, where they're trying very hard as a platform to make sure that everything conforms to this standard. But changing that paradigm so that it's not about trying to enforce the exact same standard across the entire platform, but giving users more choice actually relieve some of that burden on the platforms and is better for the individual users as well, where um, what they're seeing can be much more contextualized to them, to their communities and those different contexts. Right, right. And you, you've sort of touched on this this delicate balance that needs to be struck between, um, you know, preventing harassment or uh, discriminatory content from coming through and also, uh, you know, the censorship of legitimate ideas, which these things can also be weaponized to do. And I'm just, you know, we've talked on this show uh, a lot in the past about so-called filter bubbles, where people sort of end up in these spaces on the internet where they don't see dissenting opinions and they end up in these very closed kind of ecosystems. Do, do you ever worry that giving people the ability to filter what they see to this degree could kind of reinforce those those filter bubbles? Does that ever cross your mind? It's definitely something we think about. The first thing I kind of point out is there is general research that shows that people who are online actually get exposed to more diverse information than those who aren't. Um, so this phenomenon of filter bubbles can happen, but it's not necessarily like writ large across the entire internet right now. Um, but the big danger of filter bubbles is when people are exposed to them without realizing that that's what's happening. And they think that all the information they're getting is sort of like reflective the totality of reality. The algorithmic adaptations that happen, so like the way that the home feed algorithm on Facebook responds um, to you and the way that it gives people quote unquote what they want will often reinforce people's existing opinions. But if you ask people what they want, they don't usually say that like, they only want things that reinforce their opinions, right? Um, and sort of like my experience, I think about uh, going on Facebook it tends to show me stories from tabloids and sometimes I can't help but click on them. I would never buy a tabloid off the magazine rack at the grocery store. Like I, I see all these tabloids. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy one of those. If I were to buy something, I would buy a copy of the New York times or Washington post. If I wanted news, but you can't get that kind of choice now with these algorithms that determine everything you're going to see online with middleware and like being able to choose um, it actually makes it more possible to get the experience you want. So kind of going back to the way it was before the internet where people would have much more um, choice over what media they would consume or not. Like we can get back to that. Um, mm-hmm. The way that Block Party works right now in a different way also helps this um, where we're cutting out the lowest quality um, content, the trolls, the bots and the noise. And it, it makes the platform more usable. Right. So you can actually see differing opinions um, and engage with a wider variety of users and content. And these filtration algorithms that that you've built, how effective actually are they in preventing unwanted or harmful content from reaching people? And 
to what extent does there need to be a human moderator who remains in the loop and kind of oversees their function? Yeah, the experience of users who are on Block Party right now, where we're using actually sometimes like very simple heuristics uh, to filter out users. Heuristics like, does this person have a very newly created account? Do they have fewer than 100 followers? It actually works really well. Um, the feedback we get from folks is like, oh, like I can actually use Twitter and it's not noisy and difficult anymore. So sometimes simple heuristics work great. These things are never going to be perfect. And whether it's heuristics or machine learning algorithms or other things that we're kind of putting in there to try to be smarter about filtering, there will always be mistakes. And my personal opinion is that it is very important to have humans in the loop and constantly assessing what is happening with the technology we're using, identifying any changes in behavior as well and any adaptations we need to make. There's a lot of things that are going to need um, nuance and context and understanding. Um, one of the difficulties with very technical solutions is that they'll miss out on a lot of sort of like societal context or cultural context. Uh, and so you need humans to look at this stuff. One example that I've seen is people trying to send racist comments to me um, of the form, like, don't accidentally eat your dog. And it's referencing, obviously, like a, this racist trope about Koreans eating dogs. I'm not even, I'm not Korean, but the racists don't really care. I, you know, there's just kind of like uh, tagging along to these racist tropes. Can these, can these filters filter out according to IQ? Do they have that function? <laughs> <laughs> working on that, working <laughs> on it. So, you know, on top of these, um, these software solutions, you've also talked a lot in the past about how better regulatory frameworks can help with the issue of online harassment. So, you know, and I guess to that end, the government also has, has a big role to play. And the government has a pretty bad track record uh, when it comes to actually understanding the issue, among other things. But so, it, you know, in terms of policy, what are some changes that you would like to see lawmakers advocate for that that might have a sort of immediate impact on this problem? The thing that regulators can actually legislate that would be very helpful around improving social media platforms is having them open up. Um, so it looks like more transparency, more interoperability, more ability for third parties and other developers to be building solutions on top of the platforms. Mm-hmm. Like you know, what we're trying to get to, it's very difficult for um, a regulator to say like no harassment or no misinformation because like, you know, how do you even define those things? How do you enforce it? Mm-hmm. But from the technical perspective, forcing platforms to open up is something that you can require. So right. like you must allow people to be able to choose the algorithm that um, determines what they're seeing in their timeline. So the way this looks on Twitter right now is they've actually implemented it uh, within the platform. You can look at the ranked timeline or you can look at the chronological timeline. So the ranked one is Twitter making some decisions around what is more important to show you. And chronological is just based on like when things were posted, we show them to you in that order. Mm-hmm. But you can imagine other um, algorithms that could reorder what you're seeing. And what would be possible to legislate is Twitter or whatever other platforms like must open it up such that it is possible for other people to choose this. Or like right. if you could imagine on Facebook right now, they have no option for you to go chronological. You could imagine the platforms being forced to then like open up so that it is possible for somebody else to implement a chronological feed. I mean, that sounds nice to me. I would I would like a few less articles about uh, how we know that Bill Gates is a lizard person. That sounds... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would actually appreciate that greatly. So um, what I want to end with here is clearly you're hard at work on, on trying to tackle this issue. There's other people also advocating for these changes. Um, but in the near term, if you're somebody operating online, you know, especially if you're uh, a marginalized person or if you're involved in any sort of advocacy that leaves you vulnerable to things like trolling or just online harassment in general... Do you have any tips for how you can keep yourself, um, you know, safe from harassment or, or online abuse? Yeah, there aren't any perfect solutions around keeping yourself safe fully online. But one key thing is know that you can proactively set your own boundaries and it's okay to liberally use the mute and block buttons. 
people aren't entitled to your time or attention. So it's fine to establish those boundaries. There are third party tools. So it's no longer you either have to like suffer or wait for platforms to improve. Like there are um, increasingly more solutions um, in a growing safety tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And this is more um, just sort of like general advice around engaging with technology. Like it's fine to take a step back when you need to Mm -hmm. and be aware of what the impact um, is on you. One big thing for me was realizing that seeing harmful content in periods of attack was really damaging for my mental health. And Mm -hmm. it was important for me to like take a step back and then things do calm down at some point that I could come back and kind of protect my mental health at the same time. It didn't mean that I had to step away forever, but it's just trying to be mindful of what that impact was on me. Right. Sounds like sage advice. Tracy, thank you so much for giving us your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Tracy Chow the founder and CEO of Block Party. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can also call us and leave us a voicemail. The number is 416-935-5935. This show is also available wherever you get your podcasts. We'd really appreciate it if you found us there and left us a positive review. My name is Joe Fish, and on Monday, Jordan will be back in his rightful spot in the host seat. Have a nice weekend.